So welcome to our first uh, Pacific Seminar Series. My name is Daniela Medina, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm a PhD student at the University of the Sunshine Coast, and I'm associated um, to the center. So I will be chairing uh, today's seminar, and my friends and colleagues, uh, Bridget and Melanie Harris, will be helping me manage the chat and the questions. So this is the inaugural seminar of the center. And for those of you who have not heard much about it, the center is going to uh, try to continue hosting this seminar series uh, once a month. And the aim of this series is just to uh, share different uh, aspects of the research that's conducted uh, by different members of the center, but also by the partners that we collaborate with. Uh, we would also like to use these seminars to share work or col cultural experiences around the Pacific and just to stimulate conversations and connections um, across all um, the community of, of scholars and researchers that participate in, in the Pacific Island region. So this is our inaugural seminar and we have the pleasure um, to have Stephen Underhill, who is the director of the center, um, start this seminar series. So for those of you who don't know Stephen, uh, Stephen is a professor of horticulture and uh, his research centers on nutrition sensitive horticultural food systems in the South Pacific and Southeast Asia, where he's working with smallholder farmers and local government agencies to improve their post-harvest handling and quality management supply systems, food marketing and distribution systems and institutional capacity building. Professor Underhill has advised the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, and the Samoan national governments on policies and strategies to reduce horticultural food loss. So today his presentation will focus on food loss in the Pacific. And I'll um, pass it on to Stephen so he can begin his presentation. What I'm going to try and do in this talk is I want to give you basically an overview of the last 10 years of work that I've been doing and, and some of my colleagues have been doing in the South Pacific, trying to look at food loss. Um, and so that's going to involve quite a bit of bouncing around in terms of micro studies, meg mega studies, um, long term studies and different countries. So I am going to bounce all over the place, but there are some common themes that I want to drag out that these different um, studies actually start to give us um, some understanding of. In terms of the structure of the talk, I just want to unwrap the methodology of the process because there is a little bit of a journey here about how we've started to unpack food loss in the South Pacific. I want to try in the context or the body of the presentation to talk about what I think is a very close relationship between food loss and the food system. And, by, and what I mean there is, is that the food system and food loss um, interact in a way that they both bounce off each other in positive and negative ways. And I want to wrap the talk up with basically, um, I suppose, a, a message to those of us that are practitioners in the development space, which is please spend time trying to understand the thing you're trying to fix before you rush in to try to create an improvement. Because in my limited experience, we tend to make things worse than better in most of the cases. And so it's a call to arms in the sense of understanding or endeavouring to understand the, the space that you're actually working in. So let's just move through. So in terms of the methodology that we applied in terms of food loss, um, we started this journey um, way back with a whole lot of really, really high intensity single chain review studies. And those of you that have sat through some of my presentations in 2013 and 2014 on tomatoes will know exactly what I'm talking about, where we effectively pulled apart um, chains where individual fruit were counted and we accounted for every single product moving from the chain from, from point one to through from the farmer through to, to, to point of cons consumer purchasing. And so we started with really intense chains. Um, and that gave us a bit of an idea about what was going on. We then had to look at what sort of methodologies we're going to look at. And so this is trying to understand the difference or the benefits of direct determination, which is effectively the messy stuff of physically counting every single piece of lettuce and taro and rotten piece of banana and so forth, or um, 
recall, which is a survey based methodology. So both have their limitations and both have their benefits. And so we did a whole lot of work to try and um, determine which one we were going to use. And, and that involved some of the work we were doing in Solomon Islands, um, which effectively was trying to do concurrent assessments using both methodologies at the same time. And what we effectively found through that process was in the Pacific, we can reliably, with some degree of confidence, use re recall-based methodologies or survey-based methodologies. And the reason we can, we can use those is when you look at supply chains in the Pacific, they tend to be very, very short, short distances, small amounts of volumes being moved around. And in most cases, the person growing has some element of participation in the transport and the trade. And so there is all all these feed loops in terms of the vendor and the farmer um, having a reasonable good understanding of what's going on in terms of the loss equations. So the farmers in the Pacific from, from a generic um, perspective tend to have a pretty good idea at the amount of losses um, that they're incurring. Quite different to what might be in a, in a more developed Western society type situation where you have very long chains and multiple actors involved in those chains. So we then started knowing that we could use recall move into whole of market studies looking at municipal markets roadside market studies because again the pacific tends to have very low levels of grading through the chain so most farmers will pick and in most products there's limited grading that occurs so we from some of those um, intense studies it became clear that we could, again, with some degree of confidence, use market end assessment. So assessing the, the losses at the market on point of arrival and during the trading cycle, during the markets, is where we could pick up most of the losses in terms of having a level of confidence. So a lot of our studies ended up relying on recoil-based methodologies and on end of market or market end assessments. What we haven't done is focus on the consumer side of the equation. So everything I'm going to talk about in this presentation excludes the consumer side. And that's not to say it's not important. It's just it's not an element of which was included in our studies. So in terms of these whole of municipal markets, whole of roadside studies, the uh, the journey that we've been doing through the Pacific is we, we did a whole lot of um, work on um, trying to understand food loss in, in Samoa. And again, this is stuff that was 2014, 2015, 2016. Um, we then went back and did some work in um, Fiji, looking at the food loss, particularly around the Nasori market, the Singatoka market, the Suva market, um, and the Nandi market. And in some cases, looking at those under relatively interesting situations, like how does a cyclone impact on the trading activities and the food losses in the Nasori market, for example. Um, we then set up a series of studies looking at um, food loss in Vanuatu, both around Afate, looking at some of the losses in the roadside market structures, municipal markets, but also um, some of the, the losses in the municipal markets up in the Northern Islands in Espiritu Santo in Luganville. Um, so this is around 2016. 2017, 2018, we did a whole lot of work looking at food loss studies um, on the Guadalcanal Canal, mainly on the Honiara markets, but also in the roadside market structures, There's about seven or eight different roadside markets in the greater Honiara area. We also had a look at um, municipal market loss in um, Malaita. Um, actually, we've actually got an ongoing study. We're looking at um, market loss in the Aoki municipal markets in Malaita. And we've been continuing that, that food loss study every month where we're assessing food loss there in that market. And we've been doing that now for about four years continuously. So it gives us some really rich data about pre-COVID, COVID and hopefully a post-COVID type outcome. And then um, in 2019, we, we did a, um, a series of um, studies on a series of markets, roadside markets, multiple islands in, in Tonga. Um, and so last year, we actually went back and did some um, interesting stuff um, looking at COVID-related implications. And COVID's a really, from a practitioner's perspective, a really interesting tool, if you can call it that, to understanding um, food loss in Pacific markets, because COVID changes the dynamics and, and places pressure on some of the these food systems. When food systems are under pressure, you can actually get a really good idea about how vulnerable and how fragile they actually are when you have an artificial um, stress put on them. So we've worked around the Pacific. So um, in terms of these food loss studies, what I'll now do is just give you some examples 
of some of those studies that you can um, um, get an idea. But I just want to highlight one extra point, which is we also did in wrapping up this work, we also went back and did a whole lot of low intensity um, chain studies from a food loss perspective. So we sort of started at chain specific studies, went into whole of markets and have come back to chains. And the idea around these less intensive chain studies, and what you can see here is just a few examples of some of the markets and the islands we've looked at, and red lines give you a, an idea of the distribution channels that we were assessing. Um, what we were trying to do in some of these micro studies was not to give a level of quantification or verification to the data sets, but was to try and understand the behavioral elements behind why things were happening. So it's one thing to put numbers on a loss equation, but it's another thing to start to understand what the behavioral contributions of what's actually occurring in terms of why they occur. And also what are the wider implications that are driving those behaviors in terms of how the actors in the supply chain, farmers and vendors are interacting in terms of the wider food system. So we sort of come full circle in terms of trying to figure out what's going on, um, what and how it compares to different locations, and then trying to understand the reason why that's occurring. So if we drift into some of these case examples, so this is um, some work that we were doing trying to quantify um, losses in Samoa, and this is slightly older data, but it gives you an interesting um, perspective of the journey that I'm trying to unwrap here. Is this some of this the stuff that we were doing in Samoa in 2015? Was some of the first times we were starting to see evidence in the Pacific of, of very different levels of post harvest loss or food loss or horticultural loss occurring depending on the market type, market location. Um, and quite different, distinct differences here. We have the Tafusi market, which is a private market, the municipal market, which has gone through significant change, the Vitelli market, which now longer, no longer exists, the Afenga market, that effectively has been transitioned into a retail shop, um, and so forth. So these markets have also changed quite radically um, in response um, since this study. But it's also interesting that this was some of the first evidence that we found um, with significantly lower or noticeably lower levels of post harvest losses and food losses occurring in the roadside market stalls. And you'll find through this talk that I'm going to be leaning over and over and over again to try and highlight in my mind um, a clear distinction that the, the roadside market stalls or the roadside market distribution systems both have a contribution in terms of lowering loss but a criticality in the food distribution systems. One of the other things we, we, we looked at um, in terms of the Samoan market was what happens if. So in the case of the numbers that I presented, that is what's happening in a commercial situation, the five to 10 to 15% losses type situation. But what happens if there was for one reason or another at a delay in the actual time it takes product to get from the, through the market itself? Um, and so what we started, we did a series of, and I'll just use some, some two commodities just to, to give you a, an idea, um, taro and Chinese cabbage, is that while some of the post harvest loss numbers that you see in the Pacific are very, very low, they actually hide a problem in terms of the system having a high degree of vulnerability to losses if there is any delay in the system. So while we look at the numbers in terms of post harvest losses, um, in Pacific markets as being proportionally lower to a lot of other places in the world, what stands them out in terms of then their, their, their risk is that vulnerability. All it takes is one extra day of a product needing to stay in a market for whatever reason, the road down, the market's closed, the bus didn't turn up, the farmer was sick, some, and suddenly 1% losses go to 25% losses. And so, the important thing I'm trying to unwrap here is in the Pacific, with a limited access to post-harvest handling, infrastructure, cold rooms, and so forth, the way the, the Pacific tends to manage those, those constraints is it works on this concept of fast to market. The farmer tries to pick the product and get it to the marketplace as quickly as possible. The market needs to get that product through that marketplace as quickly as possible. And the product needs to get consumed as quickly as possible. So speed, to, to quote Jeremy Clarkson, speed solves many problems. So that's the way the Pacific gets around it. 
And in most cases, when we look at the numbers, the numbers tend to suggest that the Pacific is particularly good at doing this. It's small, local, small distances, small volumes, um, moving traditional crops around. Um, so it does a really good, a good way of doing it. But the critical point that I'm trying to highlight here is while the numbers are low, there is very, very little space for error. So when things go wrong, they go wrong seriously, very, very quickly. So there is no, there is an innate sense of vulnerability in food systems in terms of loss when you get exposed to external shocks. So you can understand why we become particularly interested in how the food systems responds to say COVID when, farm, when the bus is not moving as quickly as possible to the market or the market's closed or the farmer has an extra step to get the product to market. Um, you can see that that then very quickly has disproportionately higher losses that are generated. So I'm going to flick across and we'll move countries now. So move across to Solomon Islands. So we were doing a whole lot of work in Solomon Islands trying to quantify post-harvest losses in the Honiara market and in the roadside markets. So in the roadside market network in Greater Honiara, there is about seven, eight or nine different roadsides markets that exist, whether it's Henderson Market near the airport or White River or Fishing Village or, or so forth. So there's a, this large network of roadside markets. And then you've also got a central market, which effectively is busting at the seams in terms of space requirements. You've also got quite a different volume of product being moved and you've also got a quite different trading practice. When we look at the numbers, and we, we, we've done this multiple times in terms of looking at seasonalities and so forth, we tend to constantly get this number around about 10%, 5 to 7 to 10% type loss. Now, that's really, and it does change from season to season, and it does change in terms of market type, and it does change to location. But we, in terms of some of the loss studies that we do, we constantly see this number of about 10 to 12 to 15% constantly coming up time and time again when we look at Pacific markets. And when you look at that number and you start comparing it to what you see elsewhere in the world, when you read the literature on the food loss, people talk about 30%, 20%, all these really high numbers. Um, in the Pacific, what I think is actually happening here and what these numbers are suggesting to us us is that is the threshold and this is the whole of the market so i'm not suggesting that some vendors are doing it really tough and some vendors are not doing it really well but generically across the board we're getting about that five to seven to ten percent loss what i'm saying here is this is the number at which i think that level of loss becomes uneconomically becomes financially um, unsustainable for the vendor to incur. And so when you start getting um, consistent losses above um, that 10 to 15% from a particular supply chain, what we tend to see is that the vendor changes the practice. They either don't source from that particular farm, or they don't source from that particular location, or they don't support, they don't source from that, from that particular um, transport logistics process. And in some respects, that makes a lot of sense in that, you know, a vendor is trying to make money. And as a consequence, there is only so much loss of profit that they can actually absorb before they start changing their practices. Now, some chains have the option to reconfigure other sources of product and other sources of locations and other don't. But what we tend to find is that is the threshold where I think the market starts to re-regulate its supply chains to try and reduce the loss. So I'm suggesting here, is, the, is in itself self-regulating all the time through up, up regulation to try and keep these losses vendors can actually tolerate. So different vendors have different tolerances, um, different markets have different tolerances, but it's important to highlight that there are those ceilings whereby anything above that in a consistent manner, we start to see behavioral change. So interestingly, when we start unwrapping some of these losses, so when we do these whole of supply chain, uh, whole of market losses, um, what we can do is we can identify where this product's coming from. So part of the survey method that we do, we want to know, we want to get the quantification of the losses, but we also want to know some of the practices underpinning it, but we also want to know where that product's coming from. And so um, what we tend to find in a Solomon Islands is we get significantly or quite 
we get much lower losses occurring in the intra, intra island chains. This is products moving within Guadalcanal Canal into Honiara compared to products moving from the outer islands into, into Honiara. And some respects, when you look at the, the transport routes that are being involved, the, the small boats or the ferries and so forth, that's quite understandable to some degree. But you can also wrap it up another way where the vendors in most of these outer islands are already trying to reconfigure towards product that they know can survive the transportation routes that are involved. So you tend to find that in outer island um, transports, um, particularly say Malaita, there's a heavy focus on products such as watermelons and pineapples and things that they know they've got a reasonable risk, a reasonable chance of getting from prod, from farm to market. There is a low intensity trading of leafy vegetables, for example. It does occur because the price sometimes is such a high price are it's worth it's 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 worth its chance to take it have, to have a go. When you do have a look at some of these close proximity islands where there just isn't the economic alternatives to trading on the marketplace. The vendors are just are so economically requiring to take that risk, they take that risk. Better to have, some, to have some economic gain than no gain at all. So you tend to find that when vendors and losses start to exceed that 15%, it tends to be because there is other, concert, other things happening in the chain that, 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 that it's worth taking that risk. Either there is no other economic opportunities or the other crops can't be grown there. So a good way of just wrapping that up is when we take this same data sets and we start looking at um, where are the farms where we know have the highest amount of losses occurring, we start to see some interesting data where the yellow is low moderate losses, orange medium and red very high losses. But this is the central market in Honiara. And yet these points here that you're seeing on the side, this is effectively, you've got markets all the way around. Surely the, the logic would be that those markets or those farms that are most remote with the most challenging supply chains would be the ones where we would expect the greatest amount of losses, not the markets that are in the peri-urban locations with the very close proximity. In fact, when we look at the correlation between transportation distance to market in Solomon Islands and post office losses, we see very, very weak correlations. And so what happens here is that of these farms in the more remote locations, they've already regulated the product that they're selling. So we know that they're starting, they, they've transitioned away from highly perishable products to the more um, pro the products are the root crops or to the watermelon or to pineapple or crops that they have a chance of being able to tolerate the supply chain itself. And so here's an interesting example of where post harvest loss has a feedback loop in terms of starting to drive farmer behavior in terms of what products farmers are starting to grow. Um, and so losses can stay low, um, but there are consequences that occur along the wider supply chain and along the market system that create that paradigm. And so suddenly losses now start to dictate what farmers are growing, where they're growing it, and, and who is participating in the market and who is not participating in the market. Just want to move across to Tonga. So we've gone, we've, we've, we've just keeping the journey going. Tonga is a really, really interesting um, food system from a food loss perspective. So we've, we, so Tonga is quite interesting and it has a central municipal markets and a large, large network of roadside markets um, that fill. And so we're looking at Tonga Tapu. So this thermal heat mapping is the, is the GIS distributional location of all the roadside markets that, that, that um, occur um, in um, Tonga Tapu. So when we did a, a large study over an entire year um, looking at um, losses and, and the data sets I've got here, we've enriched them because I wanted to make sure we had multiple seasonalities. But when we look at food loss in Tonga, we get almost believably low amounts of loss, losses that you don't see anywhere else. So we're seeing two to three to 4% losses, which if you were to present this um, in a publication, you'd have a reviewer questioning the, val the, validity of the validity of that data set. Very, very low. When we actually did, dissect and, and disaggregate some of those losses, what we actually have is we have, have a small cohort of, of vendors 
who have very, very high losses and a large cohort with very, very low losses. So the first question we've got here is, knowing the food system, why would that be the case? Well, there's some logical reasons why we would expect Tonga to have at least slightly lower levels of, of food loss. One is you've got a very, very low consumption rates of leafy vegetables. So you've got a, a, a focused diet on root crops that are relatively tolerant to the food system of, of post harvest handling practices. We've got a very, very decentralized food system where it's relatively easy to get an access um, access the fruit and vegetables. You've got very, very small quantities of product being moved around. You've got high levels of, row, of, um, of car ownership and you've got a very short transportation distances. So there's lots of things happening in the wider space which would suggest that it would make it easy for um, Tongan consumers and Tongan vendors to keep their losses down. But if we drill into it a little bit further through some of the behavioral activities, when we look and start assessing vendor practice and in terms of what vendors do to mitigate their losses, what immediately stands out in a Tongan sense is the primary tool that Tongan vendors will use to reduce their losses is to reduce the amount of product they're purchasing and, and moving through the, 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 the supply chain in the first place. So in terms of and so they upregulate the supply or upregulate in terms of restricting supply into the marketplace as they're one of their primary strategies to reduce the losses. So suddenly now you've got the vendors working against the supply into the market as one of their tactics to reduce the losses they incur. And we can see this in practice. So when we look at the average, um, we look at vendor um, product life cycle, the average product in a Tongan market is gonna sit on the market for between about 12 to 18 hours, quite distinctly different to what it would be in say the Samoan municipal market, which is about 2.6 days. So product is moved very, very quickly. Now that's a generic statement because if you sort of pick examples like watermelon and others, you can have watermelon sitting on the side of the road for weeks and weeks and weeks but watermelon in the context of how it's grown and produced, they can tolerate that. But generically, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an overarching statement, product moves through that chain very, very quickly. But just knowing that you've got vendors now working against supply in, into the market to try and mitigate their losses is another interesting example by where losses actually start to have lower and wider implications of the food system. I mean, we've got a situation where we've got donors and practitioners try to increase production supply of product into the Tongan markets from an NCD perspective um, to try and increase the availability of fruit and vegetables to try and um, offset um, dietary behavior. But we've got a vendor process trying to work against that process for, for a different set of reasons. So just, I just want to touch further on this roadside network before I move off Tonga. I think um, roadside networks, now Tonga is a good example because we've got the high, some of the highest rates of dietary based in, in NCDs in, in, in the Polynesian cohorts. But this roadside um, vendor network creates this decentralization of the food system. And I think that's absolutely critical. If you look at some of the literature that's coming out, and it has been out for years and years and years, that says decentralized um, fruit and vegetable systems that creates accessibility and enhanced accessibility drives food consumption behavior. Um, and so I think what, what I'm trying to highlight here is that the critical importance of the food, of the roadside networks and a decentralized food system hasn't been fully appreciated by those people who are playing around with food access. So you have the donors building great big monoliths of municipal markets, trying to centralize food systems. And you've got, you've got and, and overlooking the potential benefits of very, very low cost infrastructure that creates decentralized road systems. And a good way of putting this, and I, I'm about a year out of date because I haven't traveled, but there's a whole conversation going on in the, in the Solomon Islands space where you've got all these road networks and the government trying to make a decision about whether that's good or bad and whether they transition them away from roadside networks into, into community markets or municipal markets or what they do. And so this is very topical conversation about the how do you if, you, if you do see a value in the roadside markets, 
how do you effectively manage roadside markets to get as much out of that decentralization of, of the food system that you possibly can? Um, I won't talk about it, but this whole question of speed to market um, as the strategy of getting product um, and reducing food losses. We've also started coming at this the other way. So there was a study that we did um, last year um, which was just trying to understand where are all the vendors? Where are all the markets that are selling fresh fruit and vegetables? This is Fiji. Um, where do they occur? And where are the outlets that sell different types of fruit and vegetables located? And all of this is about us trying to unwrap the food distribution accessibility landscape, in this case in Fiji, in terms of it's, you've got the equation of how easy is it to get the product from the farm to the market? But then the other hand is where is the market going to be located to make it as easy for the consumer to get to the market um, to purchase the product. And so we're starting to map where the food outlets are, both from, from a fresh horticultural perspective. Um, and then you could start overlaying that with information in terms of the consumer cohorts, um, in terms of the accessibility to vehicles and a whole range of other filters you can apply to that to start to unwrap how fast is the food system based on where the food is actually being sold in the first place. So some of the work that we're starting to do now is going, is taking some of the extensions from food loss into trying to understand the whole food distribution landscape. Um, and again, one of the benefits of the Pacific, because you're small, dealing with small island states, is you can actually do this at a whole of country type level, which provides you with a really interesting um, perspective about what's going on. Uh, so in terms of the Pacific, we, what we effectively have is we have everything from a small roadside vending stall, in, in this case, a small ride vending stall in, in, in Apia, to monoliths of municipal markets. This case is the new Nasori markets in Fiji. And we have everything in between. And we have governments and we have donors trying to, to, to come up with solutions about how they're more effectively going to manage and what they're going to put their money in and how the policy frameworks are going to be in place. Um, in terms of how food is moved, how food, food is sold in the Pacific. So if we go through examples of how this looks, what we see is we always get a disconnect. So this is the municipal markets up in Vavau. Vavau is the most Northern Ireland in the, Tong in the Tongan range. So we have a, what is a traditional rural, rural reg a regional um, municipal market, small, and so forth. But when we start looking at how the consumers interact with this market, um, the consumers are trying to interact with this market in a roadside manner. So the vehicles will drive around the markets, they will stop, they will put the, the tarot or whatever into the back and they will go. And so when you look at the, the market structure itself, all the vendors are located on the outside peripheries of the market, the whole center of the market is actually not used or has been transitioned to handicraft or something else. So in this case, what we've got is we've got a municipal markets um, trying, to, trying to act like a roadside markets in terms of its practicalities. And when you come back to what I'm saying is, as soon as you get interface breakdown between the consumer and the, and the market vendor that, relate, that creates time inefficiencies, we start to see losses. So if we look at it another way, this is the roadside market structure in, um, this is a roadside market just outside of the wharf in Tongatapu in Tonga. So you've got um, a structure here, which um, was recently built about two years ago. It was a transition from a small community market, it was a little bit further out. So what we were trying to do here is we, we sat some drones above the marketplace, as we've done in other places, just trying to understand the traffic flow and, and just trying to understand how consumers are interacting with this market from a physical access point situation. So what, what we see here is we have a roadside market on the roadside, which has been structurally designed to be a little bit of a roadside market, a little bit to be a municipal market, and designed in a way that you effectively can't get cars between the two. So it's trying to figure out what it's actually trying to, what it's trying to act like. And so when you look at the, the trading activity, all the trading activity is in these, these, these stalls here and these stalls here, these ones are effectively completely empty. So we've just wasted half our money building something that's not fit for purpose. And again, it's a good example of trying to understand how markets should be designed and operated 
two, the greatest efficiencies. And when I'm coming back to food loss, any efficiency in the marketing system that interacts and slows down consumer interactions or necessitates the product to stay in that market longer than it needs to has a food loss um, outcome as associated with it. And now we start going and exploring the ways that some of the donors start interacting with uh, markets in the interface. So um, in Malaita, Malaita's um, experienced an explosion of degree in these small community markets. So what I would draw your, situ your, your, your attention to is on the right-hand side, we've got the traditional, um, the traditional roadside markets. Markets. It's called force them to stop, force them to buy, force them to move on, force them to make some, uh, some money. This internet is saying it's unstable. Am I still okay? Yeah. So in response to trying to force markets better, you can actually see for some markets there. What the donor's done is decided that unlike a roadside markets, we'll build a semi-regional community markets. Um, and what we'll do is we'll position it about 20 metres off the road. So we can't actually operate as a roadside market. Um, we'll actually big, dig, dig a big ditch between the roadside just to make sure that it's almost impossible for the roadside stall to get. And we'll move, it, we'll move it another 50 metres from where the bus stop is, just so it's impossible for anyone to actually use. Just looking at bigger, brighter and a bit of bricks and mortar being obviously better, better than what the Pacific solution was. But you can see down the bottom, the level of occupancy is slightly less than zero. So um, I suppose what I'm highlighting here is not to come in, in with, and it's this conversation about what's the best way of selling fruit and vegetables and where should we should sell fruit and vegetables. I think in many cases, the Pacific has actually got the solution right because vendors are economically empowered and economically incentivized to get it right. Uh, to be very careful about coming in with infrastructural solutions um, that in most cases can make things worse. And a good example of that is um, the Samoan markets. Um, I think the new Samoan markets that cost, I don't know, 10, 20 million dollars actually increases for food loss because they've slowed down the whole consumer interaction to the, to, to the older markets, which yes, it did look really crappy, but it worked. Solomon Islands, I rushed through because I just want to try and wrap up now. Little design elements. Um, if, you don't put a, if you don't put a ramp in, or if you've got a lack of ramps, or if you've got steps um, in your design element of how you construct a market, then suddenly you create a whole way that people change the behavior. Unlike the Tongatapu market, which has no steps, we people can wall, uh, wheel trolleys in and out. Um, and you have a handling efficiency of getting product in and out of that market really efficiently. If you go to the Solomon Island situation where we don't have that, suddenly you then elevate the, the handling that has to occur and the practicalities of the losses that actually occur with the rough handling that, that's then driven. So a simple thing like a bit of a step or no step within a marketplace can drive complete changes in how people interact with that market and create losses. So I just want to finish off on a few slides just to highlight some of the, what I think are some of the innovations and activities that are going on in the Pacific. Just to say, I don't want to leave on a, on a negative note in terms of, look, we haven't done much and, and we're making it worse. There are some really interesting examples of very, very cheap solutions that can be applied to reduce food losses in the Pacific. This is the Luganville markets. Um, and this has a really interesting process where it has a vendor rotational system where vendors are only allowed to be in that market for two days and then you move on to a different cohort within, um, within um, a spirit center where another set of villages are allowed to participate in the markets and moves on. And that simple structure of having a rotational known process changes vendors' behavior radically. When they know they've only got two days to participate in the markets, the whole interactional process changes. And so policy changes work um, and can drive in efficiencies without actually having to spend any money at all on a piece of infrastructure. Just out of interest, the Luganville Markets is one of the few examples where we see um, market recycling processes on, 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 on markets as well. Uh, Tafusi Markets, I'll, I'll, I won't cover those. Um, sometimes you just got to look a little bit. This is the, um, the Suva markets in Fiji, massive 
sea of people, sea of activities. But if you're walking around Suva at two or three o'clock in the morning, you'll realize that there is a whole new market that disappears during the day. And that's the, that's the wholesale market that reoccupies the bus stop next door. And this, this is where the trading between the farmers and the vendors actually occur. And so that whole market doesn't visually exist to most people because it's, uh, you've got to be um, in Suva at two or three o'clock in the morning, not necessarily a healthy thing to, but it, you need to be there to see that sometimes the markets are more than what you actually see during the day. And then the question is, how do you actually um, um, interact and, and assist what is highly transitional markets? Um, and how do, you, how do you take that concept of transitional markets and wholesale markets, integrate them elsewhere? Vanuatu has a really interesting, I, I think Vanuatu market vendors are some of the best market vendors I see in the, in, in the Pacific in terms of the quality and display and effort, and maybe in terms of how they present product. Now, maybe that's a lot of that driven by the high tourist visitations to those particular markets. But another thing that's also interesting in Vanuatu, particularly in, in Afate, is there is a model that's being run out at the moment looking at small regional community markets in the peri-urban area. And these seem to be quite successful and probably more successful than I've seen in any other islands. Um, and so they in themselves present a, a bit of a model that I think if you're in a Solomon Island context, if you're starting to transition away from a central market and, and, and a disparate collection of roadside markets, if you are thinking about moving into community markets, the Vanuatu model is something that's worth looking at. So some of these markets are successful and some of them are not. But I suppose what I'm highlighting here is the Pacific in itself has a whole lot of success stories buried inside it if you just spend the time to go looking. And I just want to do a little bit of a plug for UN women. Um, the simple action of spending a bit of money buying some tents to provide an elevated protection to the female market vendors and the peripheral of the markets has made a significant effect in terms of taking some of the risk factors out for food loss in terms of exposures and so forth. And we're now seeing these markets, these, these tent structures pop up in places like Lambasa, in, in Van Levu, in Savu Savu. And, and I think um, women in business are using them also in, um, in Samoa. So look, very, very low cost. And the actually benefit of some of these, these temporary structures is you can set up pop-up markets and you control the location before you start thinking about the, the, um, the, the infrastructural spend. So there are some smart stuff going on. And I suppose the other thing I'd like to plug is whoever the minister in Fiji was for designing and, and initiating the roadside vendor stalls that are being rolled out in um, Queen's Road, well done. Some of the best stuff I've seen floating around. Look, there's design elements we can take and we can take it one step further, but here's a good example of the Fiji government taking the initiative of trying to wrap the health message and a, and a support system around some of the market vendor structures. So again, a good example of and so all of these are relevant to my food loss story here is because they unwrap some of the risk factors that contribute to food loss. And last slide is the other thing that's moving around is that the, the food systems in and the, the marketing systems in the Pacific are under lots of policy changes. So one of them that is a very topical at the moment is the reduction of plastics. And plastics is one of the really simple little tools we can use as post office practitioners to try to reduce desiccation and extend shelf life. So you take plastics away because non-recyclable plastics are being banned in most markets. You see some interesting examples about how and what little practices vendors are using to try to transition to a non-plastic type market situation. So you see this in one market, uh, but you don't see it elsewhere. And that's probably one of the things I, I, I come across time again, having had the benefit of going to many, many markets over a long series of time, you see innovation in Tongan market that you don't see in Vanuatu, and you see innovation in, in the vendor market somewhere else. And there are elements of innovation all over the place in the Pacific, but it's interesting how they don't occur and they don't join up. So that's my story in terms of the Pacific and food loss. I know I've touched on it in a really, really rapid way and I've probably gone over time. Um, and I could just go on and on and on and on, but I won't waste your pay and try my patience and try your patience and so forth in terms of trying to unwrap the story. But food loss is really important. It does drive so many different things and it has such criticality in terms of how the food system works 
that we need to, you know, when you look at food systems from a food loss lens, you actually see things a little bit differently to what other people see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was an incredibly comprehensive presentation and as it was like really interesting. While you were talking, we had uh, a lot of introductions um, from the members of the audience. So we have about 36 participants, people based all over the Pacific and here in Australia. So it's great um, to see all this diversity and participation. So what I found one of the first questions we received on the chat, so it's from David. It says, Stephen, you mentioned COVID-related food shocks. We have indications that COVID response in Bougainville may have increased food production. We interpret this as resulting from the return of young, educated, and healthy labor from towns and cities. Have you observed anything like this where you work? Yes, yeah, so some of the things we found was when we did our COVID studies in Fiji, for example, Fiji government announced a whole series of um, community seed program and family seed programs. And I think what the idea was, was to try and initiate some level of food security so people could source their own product while the market was potentially closed. And what ended up happening there was, in a lot of cases, that food, rather than ending up in people's tables was then traded and sold through the markets and so we had an elevated supply into the marketplace now from a fiji situation you then had a lot of vendors a significant increase in the number of vendors in fiji and the, the feedback we get from those surveys is losses has gone significantly higher as a consequence of that elevated supply i suppose what we've got is elevated supply in, in excess of the capacity of consumers to purchase ends up leading to more product being stored in the market for longer. Great. We also have a question from uh, Declan McLeod. He says, thanks for the seminar. Is meat fish also sold at these markets? Would supply chain issues and loss be amplified for these products? Yeah, look, in the food loss studies we did um, in the COVID stuff, we did include mapping um, fish and dairy and meat um, distribution channels. Um, look, some markets have, have, have wet markets um, in terms of uh, meat products next, next to them, some don't. I mean, so Solomon, Islands, Solomon Islands is a good example where you've got a fish, and fish markets, but I haven't actually looked at those losses. Uh, I, I mean, as a horticulturalist, I've tended to keep myself in a fairly tight box around the, the area I work in, but... Um, there's obviously interest. Anything that interacts is going to have some sort of play. I'm sure of it. Great. So perhaps um, one last question uh, to wrap it up. And this is from Jaden Newell. He says, hello, Stephen. Thanks for the presentation. I have a question about looking forward. Do you think that more emphasis in the development sphere should be put on decentralized markets than centralized? If so, how do we best practically assist decentralized markets? I think if you come back to the UN process, those roads, those portable tents provide a really good tool in terms of um, putting some efficiencies into existing markets. But what I like about them as well is if you go and build a whopping great big municipal market, you've only got one go at it and you either get it right or you get it wrong, or you then understand what you need to know up when it starts going wrong. So those portable tent type situations are a good way of creating a test of how well a particular market might work in a different location with some level of protection to the vendors. And then you can establish how that market should be designed and how that market should operate. Um, but I think what you find is in, in a lot of the municipal market situations, um, most of the trading activities on a Friday and a Saturday, and for the rest of the time, the markets will operate at a 50% capacity. So there's also a different dimension about having a, a way to expand out and retract back. And so they also provide that situation. So I think we need to move from this build it and they will come type mindset around municipal markets to testing and stepping into what might be the best way of operating. And portable structures give you a way of testing the, testing the food system to see where the markets and the consumers might most interact and most most might be able to get it most right in terms of the situation. So that's what I would be suggesting is, is move from this mindset of build and they will come to, to using some of these tools. Like UN Women have shown that they have benefits, 
But let's go further than that. Let's start using it in, in a design testing model in a real life situation to see where the best markets should be and how we should operate them. Should they be a day market? Should they be a night market? When are people buying product? I mean, it's all about if the Pacific is about trying to move product as efficiently, as quickly as we possibly can from A to B to get it consumed, then you know, there are some real life scenarios about trying to figure out what that actually looks like. And the problem being here is that the market and the consumer is not standing still. I mean, you've got radical changes occurring. If you say, if you take Samoa, for example, um, the, the, the explosion of, of supermarkets and trading of fruit and vegetables being sold through supermarkets in, in Samoa is just so obvious in the last five to seven years. Um, and if that's what's going to explode elsewhere, um, then how we interact and how, how, you know, the concept of actually having municipal markets, is that a real viable long-term solution? We don't buy fruit and vegetables. We don't all go down the fruit and vegetable down to the wholesale market at Rockley to go and buy our fruit and vegetables. We buy it from, from various locations, from retail outlets from, and, and so forth. We don't have the roadside market structure that the Pacific does. So again, it's, it's understanding the consumer and working back rather than working from the donor forward, <laughs> I suppose is what I'm saying. There's so much to be gained and, and to learn. All the, all the information's out there in the Pacific because these people are trying to make a day a, a profit every single day. It's just having those conversations with the vendors. Um, they are real life testing these scenarios every single day. Um, the information's there, it's just a matter of going and getting it, and talking to them and listening and not going into the food system with preconceived ideas about how you think the food system should operate. Um, that's the sort of the catch message is, is it takes more time. I mean, my, my, I suppose my take home message, if there is one for this talk, and it's a generic one for development, it's more important in my mind to understand what the problem is than to rush in to try and fix what you think the problem was. Great, Stephen. I think that's a wonderful take home message for everyone today, uh, especially us uh, working from Australia and doing interventions in the Pacific. I think it's a really important thing to always go with an open mind and, and listen and try to understand the problems, as you said. So it's been wonderful to have everyone today in this first uh, seminar series, and we hope we can see you in our future ones. I'd like to thank um, Stephen, on behalf of all of us, and also thank you all of you for taking the time to, to attend this session and to share with us um, all your experiences and insights. Um, so have a lovely rest of the day, and hopefully we will be at least those of us who are based on the Sunshine Coast, we could see each other in person <laughs> session next month. Thank you very much. Thank you.